All right, love you guys. Glad you're here. Won't we pray? And then we'll open up the word together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to proclaim your word to your people. I thank you for the heart of each and every individual who's here today. And Father, I continue that prayer that we prayed a little bit earlier, that through the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit, that you would grant us wisdom according to your word to live by it, to live according to it, to live in truth, to be able to make decisions when the decisions are needed in our lives and the circumstances can seem so different from other people, from examples in Scripture. Um, We can feel like we're afraid to make the wrong move, to be able to pull the trigger on whatever those decisions are. And so that's why we're praying that prayer. Just give us wisdom. Wisdom from above, not earthly wisdom. Wisdom from from the Holy Spirit, like true godly wisdom. And we know that you're the source of that type of wisdom. And Father, as always, as we do every week, we proclaim that your Holy Spirit is the author of your word and your Holy Spirit is the true teacher of it. Give us us sound interpretation. Give us sound application of your word. And just control us right now as we worship through the teaching and the proclamation of it. We thank you. We pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, the title of the message this morning is Overcoming Shattered Dreams. Overcoming Shattered Dreams. And I got to tell you all, I can't help but all all week I've been hearing in my mind. uh, Do we have any 80s music fans in the room here today? Okay, we do. Man, that's shocking because that was a terrible decade of music. All right, but... There, there's a lot of you guys, but I'm just telling you, no matter what, I've still had in my head all week this week, because I've been talking about this idea of like shattered dreams and the points of shattered dreams and the title of shattered dreams. Is that bringing any songs to mind for you guys? Because you've given me, given me nothing but shattered dreams, shattered dreams. Y'all remember that? Okay. Yes, that's the 80s classic, right? Now I've put it in your mind. I've blessed you in the way that I have been blessed in that. It's terrible. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of that group. It was, it was an awful name. John, Johnny Hates, uh, oh, I can't remember. What was it? What? Jazz. Johnny Hates Jazz. Very good. Okay, very nice. That's a good one. Okay, y'all are going to all go look that up now. All right, beside the point, I've already gotten lost already. That's a record for how, how quickly I've gotten off topic, okay? Now, I want you to think about something, okay? We're going to see a key word this week. Dreams is going to be mentioned a lot in these two chapters. We're going to talk about dreams. We're going to talk about the purposes of dreams. We're going to talk about relating to the, own, uh, the dreams that we have for our lives. And I want you to think about that for just a minute. What were the dreams that you grew up with? What were your expectations that you created for what your life was going to look like at some point in time in the future? Now, for some of y'all folks in here, you're a little bit younger, So when you think about the dreams for your life, you're only thinking about the future. For some of us that have a little more experience, we think about the dreams that we once had and we compare them to where we're at now and what life actually looks like, okay? When I was a kid, I dreamed of being a professional athlete. That's what I wanted to do. I was going to be a professional baseball player, a professional basketball player, you know, something. I was going to play some kind of sport, make a lot of money, buy a house for my parents when I got older, because that's what you do when you're a professional athlete is you set your mom up, you know, when you get that big contract, and then you go broke, okay, um, for most, all right? That's what I was going to do. I was going to be a professional athlete. And then a little bit later on, when I realized that wasn't going to be the case, I didn't really have a goal for what I was going to do besides I was going to make a lot of money because that's what you did. You make a lot of money, you buy a big house, you have a nice white picket fence, nice cars, live the American dream, right? That was my goal. Now, if you would have told me I was going to be a pastor at this point in time in my life, I would have told you, well, I can't tell you what I would have told you at the time, but, but I would have thought you were crazy, okay? No joke. This is honest to goodness truth. Uh, I was teaching one time as about a 25-year-old. And again, if you would have told me when I was 16 that I was going to be a high school teacher, I would have told you the same thing. I was thinking about that idea as a pastor. So I'm in front of my classroom, and I have a, uh, I think you all understand this at this point, I have a constantly running internal monologue. That's, that's a kind way to say I talk to myself internally all the time, which might be a definition of insanity. Okay, and again, beside the point. So I'm teaching my class one day, and I'm in the middle of a lecture about something biological in nature. I don't know what I'm teaching. Photosynthesis, light and dark reactions. I mean, you know, anatomy and physiology. I don't know. But I'm talking to my class, and in the middle of my lecture, in between sentences, my internal monologue comes up, and the volume is very high, and it says exactly this. Dude, you're like a teacher. And internally, I like shuddered. 
no way. <laughs> Same thing happened to me years later. I'm at Precept, okay? This time I've been in full-time ministry for like six years. I'm in front of a room of like 400 people. I am in the middle of teaching a sermon that I've prepared for like weeks on end. And right in the middle of it, the same voice, because it's my voice, the same voice is like, dude, you're like a preacher. And I was like, no way. If you would have told me that my life would have taken me where my life has taken me when I was a teenager, I would have told you you're absolutely crazy. Now, compare your dreams to where you want to be in the future or maybe your dreams that you once had to where you are now, okay? Now, that can be a good thing. Sometimes that can be a very bad thing because you haven't gone to where you thought your dreams were going to take you. That kind of leads us to where we're at today. We're looking at the life of Joseph, and we've seen, we have seen no sin in this guy's life. We've seen nothing impure in his life. We've seen nothing really. I mean, maybe he was a little prideful. Maybe he was a little arrogant. We haven't seen any, anything explicitly that tells us that. That's kind of an interpretation of when he told his dreams originally to his family. But we've seen no overt sin issues in his life. And in fact, we've seen nothing but faithfulness. He even ran from temptation that came to him repeatedly from Potiphar's wife. And we just see this guy that seems like he has a lot of integrity. We see a guy who seems like he knows the Lord. We see a guy who, who seems like he's got everything together and God's favor is upon him and God's hand rests upon him. Yet, where is he now at this point in time in this uh, chronology? Where is he at? He's in prison. So you kind of have to start to ask the question, right? Okay, how is he going to handle his setbacks? How would you handle disappointment in your life when your dreams don't turn out like you expected them to be? And I'm sure the answer is very different for a lot of us. Sometimes we handle it well, sometimes we don't. Even in one person's life, it's sometimes we react well and other times we don't. We have to start to ask ourselves those questions. And I want you to know, there's a lot of application here for just general circumstances that we run across in our lives, but also opportunities for encouragement to equip us for a lifetime of overcoming challenges that we face and when our lives don't match the dreams that we have. So Joseph is in jail, but we understand that the Lord is with him as he always has. God has not left him at any point in time in this journey, whether he's in the pit, whether he's in jail, whether he's in Potiphar's house and he seems to be succeeding, no matter what the case may be, we've seen that God has been with him the entire time. So let's pick up in Genesis chapter 40. When it came about after these things, the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Uh, by the way, besides the song that I heard this week, I heard rub-a-dub-dub in my head like all week. I was asking, like, where's the butcher? Where's the candlestick maker? Um, also, never go look up like the nursery rhymes and how they originated because it'll shatter your childhood. Um, just trust me. Just sing them. Don't, don't look up where they came from. It's bad news. Verse 2. Pharaoh was furious with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. Now, if you read a little bit, people assume, and Scripture doesn't tell us for sure, so this is not definitive, but people assume there was a plot afoot to assassinate Pharaoh. And so he's probably trying to uncover, he could be trying to uncover who's guilty in this assassination plot. And what you got here is the guy who bakes his food and the guy who brings him his drink. And that was how a lot of these, you know, monarchs, rulers, kings, that's how they got assassinated was people would poison them a lot of times. So these two guys are in jail. Perhaps Pharaoh is trying to figure out who's guilty. And so these guys are detained at this point in time. Verse 3. So he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard in the jail, the same place where Joseph was in prison. Verse 4, the captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them and he took care of them. Translation, he ministered to them and they were in confinement for some time. Now, let me point you back towards last week. Whose house are they in jail in? Help me out, talk to me. Yeah, Potiphar's. That's the captain of the bodyguard. Who put Joseph in charge of these guys while they're in confinement? The captain of the bodyguard, Potiphar. Okay? Y'all remember how we, we speculated that maybe Potiphar really didn't believe that Joseph had done what his wife had accused him of? I think this is more, I think this is more evidence 
More, more evidence probably that Potiphar just got put in a bad situation because of his wife ac- wife's accusation against Joseph. Yet nevertheless, it doesn't change the fact that righteous Joseph still was put in jail according to an unfair accusation. doesn't change that fact at all. Verse 5. Then the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt, who were confined in jail, both had a dream the same night. Each man with his own dream and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning and observed them, behold, they were dejected. He asked Pharaoh's officials who were with him in confinement in his master's house, Why are you so sad today? All right, this brings us to our first point of application. By the way, I want want to always remind you guys, I give you points of application for the purpose of of provoking you to try to connect Scripture to real life, which is the biblical definition of wisdom. Never become reliant on one person's applications. There could be a million here that I would never be able to connect to you as an individual. This is just an exercise. This is an equipping. So maybe some of them will actually provoke you and will apply directly to you. But this is just a a way to show you like the process that you should be going through on a daily basis on your own. You know what I'm saying? Application point number one. Overcoming shattered dreams. Work to maintain your ministry mindset even through disappointment. Okay? Remind me, where is Joseph right now? He's in jail. Okay? He's in jail. He has been wrongly imprisoned. Yet, what is he aware of even though he's wrongly been put in jail? He's aware of other people's feelings. That's not me, okay? When I walk into a circumstance and I don't feel like justice was served, whose feelings am I worried about? Y'all tell me. I'm worried about me, myself, and I, okay? Like, that's pretty much it. Do y'all relate to that? Joseph is not that way. He's not so concerned with himself. He's not so inward focused that he's forgotten about other people. He's others centered. He's not self centered, even though his circumstances are not good. That speaks to a high character man. That's a high character type of trait that he is thoughtful about others who are around him. Let us not miss ministry opportunities right around us when God puts them on a tee. Just because we're not happy with how everything is going for us. Amen? Okay? That's when we miss the most ministry opportunity. Verse 8. Then they said to him, We've had a dream, and there is no one to interpret it. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me, please. Now, here's our mention. We've had three mentions of dreams so far. We're going to have a lot of mentions of dreams in these two chapters. Uh, Real quick. Just have some fun with me. What's your favorite dream? Just call it to mind real quick. What's the like most insane, crazy, funny, stupid dream you've ever had? I'm going to tell you all mine, okay? All right. Uh, I had a dream one time. I was working at Calvary Chapel. I was an associate over there. And I had a dream that I I don't know why the dream went this way. Maybe if some of y'all are prophets, you can tell me. Okay, so I'll just tell you my dream. You can give me the interpretation because I don't know what it was. All right. Some of it maybe, not the first part. So I'm out beside this pond, and I'm, I'm by myself, and I start walking into the water. And as I walk into the water, it gets deeper and deeper, and it goes over my head. And then I start walking out of the water, and I'm no longer in a pond. I'm in a swimming pool, okay? So I walk into the pond. I walk out of a swimming pool. Well, there's people at the swimming pool. Well, the people, the, the only person that I remember recognizing was Pastor Frank Ramsour from Calvary Chapel Chattanooga, my senior pastor, Okay? So he's there, and there's a bunch of other guys there, and I don't recognize any of the other guys, and I can't tell you anything that was said. I don't remember anything that was said in the dream, but here's what I remember. I remember having the sense that these other guys were, already, were kind of attacking verbally Pastor Frank. And so I just started taking dudes out. <laughs> now, I don't know if any of y'all ever watched wrestling when you were growing up, Okay. I, this looked like the one guy invading the ring, and there's like 10 bad dudes in there, and the one guy starts taking every one of them out, like one on 10, you know what I'm saying? So I'm just bashing people in the face, I'm throwing people in the pool, I'm going through them one at a time, here's the best part of the deal, I can't tell y'all everything I did in the dream, because I'm ashamed of even what I dreamed, I'm leaving details out, okay? But I start taking all these dudes out, I get to the last one, and I like, he, he's like stunned, and I grab him, and I stick his head in between my legs, and I pull him up in a pile driver position, okay? 
I, I'm not going to explain what that is to y'all non-wrestling fans, but I've got this dude's legs up in the air, and I remember dropping him on his head on the, you know, the cool decking at the pool, and my eyes went, boosh, they just woke up, and I thought, I have to remember that dream. I cannot forget that dream. I have to remember it. I remember it to this day. Always will. Favorite dream ever. <laughs> ever. Now, I can't tell you if that meant that I was, as an associate pastor, God was telling me I've got to serve and lift up and protect my pastor, you know, from the people that would attack and all these kinds of things. I don't know. I just thought it was cool, okay? But I need y'all to understand, if you look biblically, is there a purpose for dreams? Yeah, there really are, okay? There really are purposes for dreams. Now, let's backtrack a little bit. Let's talk about some dreams we've already seen at this point in time in Scripture. This may not be complete, but it'll give you an idea. Genesis 20, we saw a dream warning Abimelech, okay, who was not a believer. He was not a person of God, but God warned Abimelech in a dream, hey, don't touch that woman. She's actually the wife of somebody pretty important. It's Abraham's wife, it was Sarah, okay? God warned a non-believer in a dream. In Genesis 28, it was Jacob's ladder. And that's when God first spoke the covenant promises to Jacob and kind of passing them through that descendancy from Abraham. Then Genesis 31, you've got Jacob and his flocks. That's when God intervened in a dream, told Jacob what his breeding strategy needed to be because he had promised to bless Jacob. And so then he gave him the blueprint of how he was going to be blessed through the way he's going to breed his goats. Okay? But God's taking care of him, and God is uh, fulfilling the promises that he's authored. Genesis 27, okay? You've got, or Genesis 37, excuse me. You've got Joseph's dreams, you know, with the, the moon, the sun and the moon and the stars and the stalks and all those types of things that are a pretty immediate context here. So we've already seen God communicating himself both to followers of God and to non believers, like idolatrous people through the use of dreams, okay? Here's some other stuff I would like you to know about dreams. Are dreams relegated to only the Old Testament? No, okay? In the New Testament, dreams play a prominent role in the events around the birth of Christ and the early years of Christ, okay? Remember, uh, God came to Joseph in a dream and said, hey, don't, ab don't abandon you know, Mary, stick with her, it's going to be okay. He comes back after Jesus is born. He tells Joseph to escape, to flee down to Egypt, to avoid Herod the Great, killing all the young ones, you know, trying to stop the Messiah from coming. Uh, in a dream, he tells the Magi not to, not to go the route they had planned because he didn't want Herod to find Jesus. And so God is also active speaking through dreams in a New Testament context. Now, you may be thinking, well, that was before the Holy Spirit. Okay, true, but let, let's, keep, let's keep talking a little bit. Acts 2, verses 15 through 18. You've got Acts 2. This is Pentecost, okay? So the Holy Spirit has fallen upon his people, and, and we've got a, a sermon here where Peter starts quoting Joel, and he's quoting this end times prophecy that in the last days the Holy Spirit will fall upon his people, and they will speak forth prophecy, and they will dream dreams, and it's got all these things that will happen in the last days. Now, that's an interesting you know, uh, term, in the last days. We're going to be talking about that a little bit more in the near future. There's a little spoiler alert okay, for things coming. Uh, but this is something that's going to be mentioned in Scripture of the signs of the last days, is that God will communicate himself through dreams, the interpretation of dreams, and through prophecy. Okay? So, ultimately, let's just kind of get down to brass tacks. Like, What is the purpose of dreams? I'm going to read you just a couple things. This is Numbers chapter 12. You don't have to turn there. Just write it down. Numbers 12, <clears throat> verses 5 and 6. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the doorway of the tent. He called Aaron and Miriam when they had both come forward. Now, this is a great passage, by the way. Aaron and Miriam are getting called out on the carpet right now without getting into this whole deal. It's a really interesting passage. You kind of have the feeling that they're about to get burnt to a crisp if you read what happened. But, verse 6, he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak to him in a dream. Okay? Very simply put, where did a lot of prophecy come from that we have in the Old Testament? Where did it come from? 
It came from dreams, okay? God spoke a lot of prophecy for us that we have recorded in Scripture through the prophets, through dreams, and then they spoke on his behalf. And that's essentially what prophecy is, is an utterance on behalf of God. It's being a messenger on someone else's behalf, and that's how God communicated a lot of his prophecy was through dreams. Now, does that mean every dream is a prophetic revelation? Yes or no? Absolutely not. Okay, y'all are scared. Y'all know what to say right now. Okay, it's not. Okay, every dream is not a prophetic revelation. I need y'all to understand that. And you can even say that on the way to scripture. There's a place in Ecclesiastes that just talks about a lot of dreams are just based on activity. And, you know, I, I'm paraphrasing very, very roughly. But the idea here is very clear. Not every dream is a prophetic revelation. But we at least need to be aware of the purpose of dreams, how God has used them in the past, the fact that God can use them in the last days. And if you're thinking, well, that's future tense, I need you to understand, though, the authority of Scripture that the last days started when who showed up on the scene? Jesus. Okay, Sunday school answer, but that's right. Okay, yeah, the last days began when Jesus came. The Holy Spirit being poured out, sign of the last days, okay? So God can use dreams even today, and I would not be surprised at all if there are some people in the room today that had the spiritual gift of prophecy that could even be shown through, the, you know, through God communicating to you by dreams. Not, not surprised at all, okay? Not something I would expect everybody to have. And again, not every dream is prophetic. I'll also share this with you. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder... Okay, think about this. This is somebody who's had a dream and they even accompany the dream with a sign or wonder, like some type of supernatural power. Verse 2, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you saying, let us go after other gods whom you have not known and let us serve them. What should be happening right now? Red light, alarm, okay, right? You shall neither listen to the words of the prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death, because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord your God, who has brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, to seduce you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk, so you shall purge the evil from among you. So let me ask you a very practical question. When it comes to dreams and prophecy, what are the two things you need to be looking for to discern them by? What should you be looking for? Number one, okay, does it come true, right? Now, even if it comes true, is it always from God? Not according to what we just read, okay? Does it come true? Number two, does it contradict or confirm what? Scripture. If it can't pass those two tests, you got a problem, right? That's what y'all need to be thinking of. I want to open your minds here, okay? I believe that God can use this even today, but we have to be wise with it and discerning with it at the same time. And you need to be students of the Word because that's one of the major tests, one of the major tests when you start walking into territories like this. Okay, does it come true? Is it in line with Scripture? All right, there you go. Now, let's get back into the context in Genesis chapter 40. Verse 9. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, there was a vine in front of me, and on the vine there were three branches. And it was budding, its blossoms came out, and its clusters produced ripe grapes. Now the Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, so I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you will put Pharaoh's cup into his hand according to your former custom when you were his cupbearer. Only keep me in mind when it goes well with you, and please do me a kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For I was in fact kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing that they should have put me into the dungeon. Okay. All right, application point number two. Overcoming shattered dreams. It's okay to look to the future, 
but not at the expense of the present. Now, there's a principle here that I, that I wanted to share this with you all because I see people be on this pendulum regarding this kind of principle. On one hand, one side, one swing of the pendulum, you've got the folks who are so discontent with where they're at. Their job, their you know, family situation, their home, I mean, you, like you name it. Financial situation, it, there could be a ton of things. But they're so discontent with where they're at, that is the only thing they can think about. They're the ones that miss some of those ministry opportunities like we talked about just a little while ago. Your life is characterized by discontentment so much so that that is the only thing you can see. So your only thought process is, I have to escape. Got to get out of here. Got to make it happen. Let's make it work. I don't care. Got to go. Got to change. Got to do something. And it's kind of characterized by this fleshly thought of like, I have to do this and I have to make myself move. Now, here's the other side of the pendulum, all the way over here, okay? This deal is, well, God put me here. He's in control. He's sovereign. So I'm just kind of, I'm just going to kind of chill, just going to kind of be here. When God wants to move me, he's just going to zap the deal and it's going to happen and I'll just be over there. I'll be somewhere different, but I'm just going to wait. I'm just going to be right here, just hanging out five years later, just kind of hanging out. Yeah, you know, still real unhappy, but it's okay because, you know, God's here and he's sovereign. It's, it's okay. Or are you looking? No, I'm just going to kind of hang because God's going to do his thing, man. He's going to zap me. And yet yeah, five years later, well, just kind of hanging out, you know. He's like, bro, like, okay, let's, let's leave, you know, a little bit of fire under the fanny. You know what I'm saying? We're like, we, listen, when, when the Lord, um, when he showed me that I was supposed to go into full-time ministry, okay, I was teaching, okay, um, he showed me clearly, yet the doors seemed to be closed for a little while. Like I knocked on some doors that didn't open, okay? I, I, couldn't, get, I couldn't get interviews in churches for a variety of reasons, you know, just, just different reasons of what people were looking for. I, I couldn't even get interviews, and it was frustrating. But I took, I took the initiative when God showed me, like, this is what you're supposed to do, okay? Let me go put my resume together. Let me go talk to my references. Let me start sending them out through places where I have relationship. And when I exhaust the relationships, then I'll send them to some other places. Now I've still got my job. I've still got responsibility. I'm still coaching. I'm still doing Bible studies through FCA. I've still got to shepherd the people that God has given me and the relationships here. Is that a hard balance? Is that a hard balance? Yes or no? Yes. I'm not saying that's an easy balance. But what I am saying is, I do think that God gives us the ability to kind of step into some things, okay? To be able to use the, the, the gifts and the talents and the energy and the, you know, the minds that he's given us to be able to make a way forward. And at the same time, as long as we're still where we're at, we still have responsibilities in that place to take care of. There's a balance here. And what I see with people experientially, because I talk to people about this all the time, is they tend to be over all the way on one side, okay, or all the way on the other, I'm asking y'all to come to the middle, okay? That's what I'm asking you guys to do. Take some initiative when God asks you to step out in faith and be responsible for the things that are on your plate as long as he allows you to be in the place that you're at, okay? That's what I see with Joseph. He does speak up, okay? He's, he's being content. He's ministering to the people that are in his care. He's aware of their feelings even, Yet, does he want his circumstances to change? Yes or no? Yeah. He says, hey, when you get out of here, we, we throw, a, throw a brother a bone, okay? Let, let Pharaoh know who told you this deal, and come on, get me out of here. I, I've been put in here wrongly. I would love to get out. That's a good balance, okay? That's what I'm talking about, and I would like to see more people work in that balance. Verse 16. So, the, uh, the cupbearer has just received... This great interpretation of the dream. He's in jail. Hey, three days, man. Three, give it three days. You're going to be restored to your position. The chief baker is like, ooh, 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 do me now. Do me now. Okay, tell me my dream. Interpret my dream. It's going to be great. When the chief baker saw that he had interpreted favorably, he said to Joseph, I also saw in my dream, and behold, there were three baskets of white bread on my head. And in the top basket, there were some of all sorts of baked, good, baked food for Pharaoh, and the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. Then Pharaoh answered, or Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and will hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat the flesh off of you. 
I just heard Marlon from the Little Nemo movie. I remember it, they they see the light in the very dark places, like the lantern fish. Okay, he's like, "Oh, I feel so peaceful. I feel so relaxed." And then they see the lantern fish with the big teeth. He's like, "Good feelings gone." Okay, <laughs> that that's what just happened. Okay, to to this dude. Oh, interpret me, interpret me. Oh, that's not great. Verse twenty. Thus it came about on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants. He lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his office, and he put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Okay. Now again, put yourself in Joseph's shoes. What are you feeling right now? If the, you know, the chief cupbearer just got what you, know, what you told him, the interpretation of the dream came true, you proved yourself right again, you're in jail, even though you've been falsely accused, now the opportunity comes, you've asked the guy, hey, I'm going to do you a favor, now you do me a favor. I'll scratch my back, you, you know, your back, you scratch mine, just let him know what I did. He forgets about him, how are you feeling right now? Sure, 100%, just like any normal human being would be. Do you think Joseph is disappointed? Yeah, absolutely. Next point of application. Overcoming shattered dreams, disappointment will be a great test of your faith. Disappointment is a fantastic, not fun, not fun, but a strong test of faith. David Guzik said it, says it this way, God orders both our steps and our stops. God orders both our steps and our stops. You know, we could ask the question, hey, what is God doing here, okay? Well, we're going to talk about some of these hard questions before we finish today. What is God doing? Why would he do it this way? Why would, why would he do this to a guy that loves him, who's, who's all about you know, the Lord, who has integrity, who has character, who's doing things the right way, the favor of God, all these things? It doesn't look like the favor of God. But you know what? I think God is building character. I think God is preparing a man for, for a task that he's going to have to step into, He's given him a skill set. He's given him experience. He's, he's given him perseverance. You, you look at James chapter 1. We talked about that in our youth group a few weeks ago. You know, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter trials of various kinds. Knowing the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect result that you may, may be made perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, perfect doesn't mean free of all sin. It, it doesn't mean completely sinless. It means spiritually mature. Okay? And that's what's happening to Joseph. And everywhere along the line, we see the reaction of a spiritually mature man. A spiritually mature man. Now, I could put myself in the story, and I could probably gauge what the reaction of an immature man could be in some of these situations. Because if I put myself into Joseph's shoes, like his specific situations, I can imagine some of the things that would come up in my heart and mind in life. It wouldn't all be signs of maturity. I bet you guys are kind of the same way. God will test us, and he does test us through disappointment. Nevertheless, the story is not over. Genesis 41, verse 1. Now it happened at the end of two full years. How long? So Joseph was in jail at least how long? At least two full years. Now it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he was standing by the Nile. And lo, from the Nile there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed in the marsh grass. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them from the Nile, ugly and gaunt, and they stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. The ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows. Then Pharaoh awoke. He fell asleep again and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain came up on a single stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven ears, thin and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. The thin ears swallowed up the seven plump and full ears. Then Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Now in the morning his spirit was troubled, so he sent and called for all of the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Now if you're, if you're a student of the Bible, what book does this sound just remarkably like? Sounds like Daniel. Yeah, it really sounds a lot like Daniel. If you want to go read the first couple chapters of Daniel. Verse 9. Then the chief cupbearer spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I would make mention today of my own offenses. 
Pharaoh was furious with his servants, and he put me in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard, both me and the chief baker. We had a dream on the same night. He and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now a Hebrew youth was with us there, a servant of the captain of the bodyguard. And we related them, meaning his dreams or their dreams, to him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each one he interpreted according to his own dream. And just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me in my office, but he hanged him. Then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. Now, we're covering a lot of text very quickly because we've got a lot of verses to get to. But here's our next point of application based on what we just read. Be prepared for your opportunity. It could happen very quickly. Very quickly. Now, here's the catch, okay? And I know you, you could be thinking this. Um, we're going to see some more scripture in a minute that's going to give us a time stamp. But again, based on what we just read, Joseph was in, in jail at least how long? Yeah, so two plus years, whatever that amount of undefined time is. So you might be thinking, well, that's not hurriedly. That took a long time. Like a two-year false imprisonment sentence doesn't sound like a short period of time. No, that part doesn't. Like the trying part of it doesn't feel like a short time. But the realization of the next step hit him just like that. Okay, you got to take into account that one minute he's in jail, he's not expecting. His only thought is that the cupbearer has forgotten the little agreement they had made together. And the next minute, a guard is coming and jerking him out of the jail, saying, hey, dude, shave, put on a little deodorant, you know, let's, let's change your clothes, here's a new pair of kicks, you're going to see Pharaoh right now, okay? Like now? Like right now. Yes, right now. That happened fast, okay? That reminds me in my life of the kind of vision of this church. I've told you guys before that the, the heart to do this has been there for like 10 plus years, okay? Now... Some of y'all have heard this story, but some of you don't know this. Here's the deal, okay? Last January, January of 2017, we made the decision to start this church in Easter in January. All right, so do the math with me. How many months did we have to start a church? Three, okay? When I tell that to people, what do they tell me? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard, okay? Three months to start a church, that is insane, okay? It just doesn't happen that way. But that's what the Lord asked us to do. So I want you all to hear that. Ten years of latency, but then when, when when it was time and God called, this is happening right now, like right now. Has that ever happened for any of you guys? Okay, you got to be prepared. See, if you waste your time in that latency period, when God asks you to move quickly, you will not be equipped to see it happen in the way that needs to happen. You can't waste all that other time. Joseph wasn't wasting it. He was an administrator. He was ministering to people, even in circumstances that weren't right and were messed up, quite frankly, so that he was ready when the time came. See, every step in my life, and I feel confident of the same thing for all of y'all, Every step in my life has been used for current ministry and future preparation at the exact same time. If you miss out on the current ministry, though, you are ill-prepared for whatever God has in the future. All right, That's how you stay content in the present and minister in the present, yet also look forward to and long for what's in the future. Okay? They are, they're intertwined. And you cannot separate them. And if you're trying to separate them, you're doing one or the both. You're doing an injustice to one or the both of them. Verse 15. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream, but no one can interpret it. And I've heard it said about you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph then answered Pharaoh saying, it's not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, In my dream, behold, I was standing on the bank of the Nile. Behold, seven cows, fat and sleek, came out of the Nile, and they grazed in the marsh grass. Lo, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt, such as I had never seen for ugliness in all the land of Egypt. I can't stop talking about how ugly these cows are. And the lean and ugly cows ate up the first seven fat cows. Yet when they had devoured them, it could not be detected that they had devoured them, for they were just as ugly as before. 
I almost feel bad for the cows. <laughs> then I awoke. I also saw in my dream, behold, seven ears full and good, came up in a single stalk, and lo, seven ears withered thin and scorched by the east wind sprouted up after them. And the thin ears swallowed the seven good ones. Then I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Now Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has told to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years, and the dreams are one and the same. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, and the seven thin ears scorched by the east wind will be seven years of famine. It is as I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Behold, seven years of great abundance are coming in all the land of Egypt, and after them seven years of famine will come, and all the abundance will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will ravage the land. So the abundance will be unknown in the land because of that subsequent famine, for it will be very severe. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I, I will tell you this. The principle that I'm about to bring up, we're going, to, we're going to go into it a little bit more deeply before we finish these chapters on Joseph. But here's what I want you to think about. Okay, Who does God attribute both the seven years of abundance and the seven years of, a fam, of famine to who does he say is going to do it? Come on, talk to me. Who does he say is doing it? God does. Okay. Who does Joseph believe is going to give them abundance? Talk to me. And who does God believe is going to produce the famine? God. That's the way it looks to me, according to the scripture. I want to read you guys Isaiah 45. I had to do a quick time check here. I just got to read this a few extra verses to you here just because it is fantastic. Isaiah 45, we're going to start in verse 1. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed. Do you know who Cyrus was? He was a wicked pagan king of Persia. Okay, When you hear the Bible refer to Persia, is it typically good or typically bad? It's bad. It's kind of like Babylon, okay? If, if you hear Babylon, that's bad. If you hear Jezebel, that's bad. If you hear devil, it's bad, okay? You understand what I'm saying? That, that's what I'm talking about, all right? Cyrus is a pagan, idolatrous king, yet the, thus the Lord says to Cyrus his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through their iron bars. I'll give you treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name for the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen one. I have also called you by your name, have given you a title of honor, though you have not known me. I am the Lord, there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other, the one forming light and creating darkness." causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. That's kind of tough, isn't it? Is that not tough? Hey, let's be honest. Is that not tough? Because then you start thinking about all the bad things in life, and you're like, did, did God do that? I can tell you in the scripture here, Joseph is attributing the abundance and the famine both to God. I'll also tell you this, the Lord does not run from the responsibility of every single thing that happens. He doesn't run from any of it, okay? Absolutely none of it. He is sovereign. He is still in control. We're going to talk about his character in just a moment. But I'm okay if y'all chew on that. Because we need to talk about it some more before we finish these chapters on Joseph. God is going to send the famine. Verse 32. Now as for the repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means the matter is determined by God and God will quickly bring it about. Now let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. 
Let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land and let him exact a fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. Then let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain for food in the cities under Pharaoh's authority and let them guard it. Let the food become as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which will occur in the land of Egypt so that the land will not perish during the famine. Here's your next point of application. We may rarely recognize the plan, but rest assured, there is one. Now, you can look at the context of the story of Joseph, and does God have a purpose for the famine? Yes or no? Yeah. Now, if you were to play God for a minute, if you were to be like Bruce Almighty for just a moment, like you're Jim Carrey in the story, okay? And if you were playing God, and you were going to design this, would you choose to do it differently than the Lord has done to bring it to the point that it's going? I bet you would, okay? I bet you'd be like zapping this deal. Like, why does Joseph have to go like here, here, and here? Why does he have to take the circuitous route? You know, why does he have to do all these things? Why does he have to suffer through all these things? And like, I get that, okay? I I get that. Let's stick to what we know right here. Does God have a plan behind the famine that's coming? Yeah, And he's going to protect his people through a unique positioning of one of his servants who has the character and the skill set to be able to do what is necessary so that God's commandments and his covenants will continue to come true. He has a plan. Now, does Joseph know it yet? He has no idea. Joseph still has no idea what is happening. Is there a good lesson in that for us? Yeah, sure there is, okay? Quite often, I have no earthly idea what is happening, though I understand the trial and I even feel it, like vividly, you know what I'm saying? But I may not know what the purpose is in it. I cannot even promise you that you will ever know the purpose for it. I can't promise you that. The only thing that I can tell you is, well, who God is by nature and that he's in control over all things. And the obvious verse that you have to be thinking about is Romans 8, 28, right? For God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I want to remind you all of verse 29 that follows. I've I've reminded you all of this twice, though, okay? The good, a lot of times, is our conformity to his character. It's not necessarily the resolution of circumstances in the way that we would like it to be. And we have to remember that because a lot of times we are only focused on the circumstances and we're not focused on the character that God is desiring to shape and to form in us. Verse 32. Now as for the repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means the matter is determined by God and God will quickly bring it about. Now let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land to let him exact a fifth of the produce of the land in Egypt in the seven years of abundance. He gives him the whole plan, right? What did y'all think when we were reading through that the first time? I thought, dude, that's kind of brave. Anybody else think that? That's really brave. Like he's stepping out. This is a Hebrew. It still describes him as a youth. He comes up with a whole plan and lays it out to Pharaoh almost as if he's like, Here I am, send me. You know what I'm saying? I was like, that's my boy, okay? Like he's ready to speak out and step out into that thing. I thought it was really, really brave of Joseph. Pick up in verse 37. Now the proposal seemed good to Pharaoh and all his servants. Then Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? Okay. Now, in your Bible, is that spirit capitalized? It's not. But I do want you to understand that word can refer to the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, I think most of y'all understand this, but does the Holy Spirit have a role in the Old Testament? Yes. Okay. We, we typically talk about the Holy Spirit in a New Testament context. Yes, that is very true. But did the Holy Spirit fall upon men in the Old Testament? Certainly he did. Okay. Uh, just some examples. You've got right here, you've got Joseph. This is Pharaoh in his kind of unbiblical terms recognizing that some type of God is in Joseph. And he discerns that there's a spirit 
of a God, though he doesn't know that is the spirit of the Most High God, the one true God that is in Joseph. So we've got the sign of Joseph of having the presence of the Holy Spirit. Even more clearly than that, you've got guys like Samson. You've got many of the judges of Israel in the book of Judges that the Holy Spirit fell on them. You've got Saul. When he was anointed as king of Israel, there was a time when the Holy Spirit fell on him and he prophesied and he led well for, you know, for a little while for the people of Israel. But then the Holy Spirit was taken from him and the Holy Spirit fell upon who? David. You see back in, uh, in Exodus... You see the Holy Spirit fell upon a certain group of men and gave them the skill set and the wisdom and the knowledge to be actually the builders of the tabernacle. Okay, You see the Holy Spirit showing up in Daniel. You see him in other places, the prophets. The Holy Spirit shows up in various places all through the Old Testament to equip people for special tasks that had to be completed. Joshua was another one. He would often fall upon people in positions of leadership and empower them for special tasks purposes. And right now, Pharaoh is recognizing without being told that there's something different about this guy. And y'all listen, although now we have an advantage over many of the Old Testament saints, is it no less true of us today that when the Holy Spirit really shows them to be powerful in us, it still creates enough of a difference where people notice? Isn't that true? Man, when we live, when we live according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh, Even in our culture today, people notice. I'm telling you, that's a challenge to every single one of us. Walk according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. By the way, um, I had y'all write this in your Bible a lot of time. That's principle of first mention. There you go, 38, verse 38 right there. First mention, okay, talking about in reference to the Holy Spirit. Verse 39, so Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has informed you of all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and according to your command, all my people shall do homage. Only in the throne I will be greater than you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put the gold necklace around his neck. He had him ride in his second chariot, and they proclaimed before him, Bow the knee! And he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, Though I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh named Joseph zaphnath paneah and he gave him Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, as his wife. And Joseph went forth over the land of Egypt. Now, he's obviously given him... An Egyptian name here, okay? He's given him an Egyptian name, but I want you to understand what the name means. It's probably in the margin of your Bibles. When Pharaoh names Joseph, the name means God speaks, he lives, okay? Now, I cannot tell you if it's true. The old Jewish legends say about this time that Pharaoh burst forth into song about God. And according to legend, these were the words, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, oh, oh, he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. I really made all that up. (laughs) Pharaoh didn't sing anything, okay? But does Pharaoh recognize, again, the Holy Spirit in Joseph? Yeah. He's ascribing this to, like, God is in you. Like, God has done something. This is different. And you'll have to understand how big this is now. This is a 30-year-old Hebrew who the Egyptian king, maybe the most powerful man on the face of the earth, he will be the most powerful man seven years from now for obvious reasons, has put in charge of the entire kingdom. You understand what I'm saying? A Hebrew? Why? Because God is in him and this Egyptian godless man recognizes it. Verse 46, now Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. How long did it take for Joseph to get from the place where he had his original dreams to the place where he is now second in charge of like the world? 13 years, okay? 13 years. 13 years of preparation for the task that he has ahead of him. 
Verse 47, during the seven years of plenty, the land brought forth abundantly. So he gathered all the food of these seven years, which occurred in the land of Egypt, and placed the food in the cities. He placed in every city the food from its surrounding fields. Thus Joseph stored up grain in abundance like the sand of the sea until he stopped measuring it, for it was beyond measure. All right, now, we've got to stop for a second. We're going to add to our list. Y'all remember when we first started? We started with the story of Joseph back in Genesis 37. And we made all those comparisons to the life and the story of Christ. And we talked about how Joseph was a Christ figure in the Old Testament. Y'all remember that? Okay. Here's what, here's what we did. Okay. These are some of the characteristics that we started. We first compared Joseph to Jesus in Genesis 37. They were both shepherds. They were both loved by their fathers greatly. They were both sent unto their brethren. They were hated by their brothers. They both prophesied of their coming glory. They were both rejected by their own brothers. They endured unjust unjust punishment from their brothers. They were both sentenced to the pit. They were both delivered to the pit, though a leader, in Joseph's case Reuben, his older brother, knew he should go free. They were both sold for pieces of silver. For Joseph, it was 20. For Jesus, it was 30. They were both handed over to the Gentiles. They were both regarded as dead, but raised up out of the pit. They were both sent down to Egypt. Now, that's where we stopped after Genesis 37. Now we're picking up from there and look at more connections between the life of Joseph and Jesus. He, they were both made servants. They were both tempted severely but yet did not sin. They were each falsely accused. Neither of them made a defense for themselves. They were both cast into prison and numbered with sinners and criminals. They both endured unjust punishment from the Gentiles. They were associated with two other criminals. One was pardoned, one was not. Now this gets kind of freaky, okay? Associate the butler with his wine and the baker with the elements of communion. Some associate the three-day period before their case is resolved with the three days before the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now remember, I've never told y'all that I believe that every single one of these comparisons is is a stone-cold lock. What I have told y'all is, is when you put the number of them on the same page, it's kind of like, holy cow, like I see it. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not telling you every single one of them is like, like 100% like there it is. I'm just telling you, when you put it all on paper, it's like, oh, that's pretty good evidence. They both brought a message of deliverance in prison. They were both shown to have divine wisdom, both recognized as having the Spirit of God, both betrayed by friends, both glorified after their humility, both honored among Gentiles while still despised or forgotten by their brethren. Both were 30 years old when they began their life's work. Interesting. Both blessed the world with bread, became the only source of bread in the world. Pretty interesting parallels, right? They just keep adding up as you look at the life of Joseph and the story. Back in Genesis 41, verse 50. Now before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bore to him. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh. For he said, God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. All right, now i got to stop for just a second. Um, there is some truth to that, but has Joseph forgotten everything that's happened? No, you're, you're going to see some of this. There's still some emotional baggage there. We're going to see it, okay? Most of you guys know the story. Verse 52, he named the second Ephraim. For he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. When the seven years of plenty had been in the land of Egypt came to an end, the seven years of famine began to come. Just as Joseph had said, there was a famine in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people carried out to Pharaoh, or cried out to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph. Whatever he says to you, you shall do. When the famine was spread over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, and the famine was severe in the land of Egypt, the people of all the earth came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph, because the famine was severe in all the land. Now I want you to do something for me as we close. Y'all see the little deal that we put in all your, uh, all your chairs? Why don't you grab that? You might have put it under your chair or in your Bible or whatever the case may be. 
I need you to think about Joseph, and I need you to think about all the mess that he's gone through, okay? He had to, if he was honest with himself at all, at some point in time, he's having a conversation with God that goes something like this. God, where are you when bad things happen? Why is it that bad things happen to good people? Why do I have to suffer this way? If you're good and if you're loving, if you're compassionate and if you're sovereign and if you're all the things that that I've read about you, that I've heard about you, that I know you to be, then why do I have to suffer through all these things? I want you guys to know that I think the key is right here on this sheet of paper. Okay? Right there on this sheet of paper. What am I talking about? I think Joseph knew who God was. And I don't think he just knew who he was. I think Joseph knew God. There's a verse in Daniel chapter 11. It's the second half of verse 32. This is in reference to the last days, like after the Antichrist has come. And it says, But the people who know their God will display strength and take action. You hear that? Who will be strong and who will take action? The people that know their God. That's why I gave this to you. I think that right there is the key to you being able to fight through all the questions that we're talking about. God, where are you when bad things happen? Why do I have to suffer through these things? Okay? What is the deal? Why all of this? I think that's the key right there is to know your Lord. I want you to take it. I want you to study it. Maybe write it down in your Bible. Refer to it. You might have to memorize some of these things. Cling to them even through pain. But I just can't tell you how important I think they are. Let me just pray that God will use Joseph's story. Maybe even his suffering to help to redeem the struggles that we go through in our own lives. Why don't you bow? Let me pray for you. Father God, I thank you for each and every person that's here. And Father, I know that each and every one of them have been marked by suffering of some kind at some point in time in the past and most likely will be again at some point in time in the future. Father, would you make us a people who seek to know you? Would you make us a people who know your character so that When the storms come, when the tribulations come, when the trials come in our lives, and we know that they will, you have have not told us that everything will be rosy. You have told us that we'll have tribulation. You have told us that we'll have suffering. You have told us that we'll be touched by death. You have told us that there will be struggle and trial and temptation. I pray in those times that we would cling to your character, that you are good that you are loving, that you are merciful, that you are compassionate, that you are just, that you are righteous and holy, that you are sovereign, that you are omniscient, that you are omnipotent, that you are all-powerful. And Father, even that we would be comforted by the fact that your ways are higher than our ways, that we cannot fully comprehend you or your plans. And I pray for my brothers and sisters here, and myself, that in our pride, we would not seek and demand every answer to every question, but we would simply run to our Heavenly Father, who loves us with an everlasting love. And then in many cases, that would be enough to satisfy. Make us some people that trust you. Help us to trust you, because we know you're trustworthy. In the name of Christ we pray.